Hello everyone and welcome to my channel this is the 78th part of what if Deku had a robot wolf I hope you enjoy link to the original story and author in the description. Chapter 78, Lagrange Point L3 Earth Sun Lagrange Point L3 A small flash of light illuminated the darkness of space for less than a second before vanishing, leaving behind a small craft floating in space. A few moments after it appeared its engines and maneuvering thrusters burned to life. Inside the craft, the dreadnought Serata sat in the passenger bay. Several holographic screens floated in front of him. Some displayed information important to his mission here, others displayed statistics relating to Imperial forces within the system. And two displayed information on the hybrids. My lord, the pilot said telepathically. We have arrived. Good, Serata replied as he brought up a new screen, this one showing the outside of the ship. Specifically, their destination. The IFS Rupee. A mobile platform in use by the Semitic Imperial Navy and center point of the Imperium's L3 base. A large dark purple and red drum with a docking ring floating in space. It was the command base for all Imperial operations in and around the system, and the home base for Imperial Carrier Battle Group 69. Patrolling around the platform were two Imperial Star Cutters, with a third one docked with the platform itself, as well as several similarly shaped destroyers and smaller patrol vessels. Fearsome warships shaped like spearheads, with several dusty plasma radiators built onto their hulls. Only a small portion of a much larger fleet. IFS Rupee, this is Jump Ship Valiant. Requesting permission to land, the co-pilot said as he sent the necessary clearance codes to the platform. Jump Ship, ship Valiant. Security code received and accepted. Proceed to landing bay 2. Welcome back to the nest, the flight deck officer responded. Roger that rupee. Glad to be back. My lord, incoming message from the risky boots. Patch it through, Serata responded. One of the holographic screens in front of him changed to display the captain of the risky boots, a young-looking man in an Imperial Navy uniform. A dark purple and red one-piece uniform. What is your report, Captain? Serata asked. One of our swan singers reported hearing a ship transitioning into the stream a few days ago. It was in the vicinity of Earth, the risky boots captain reported. It was detected an hour after the last heretic was killed. Interesting, Serata remarked. Any idea of what vessel it was? Negative, we weren't able to get eyes on it, the captain replied. We weren't even aware that there was another ship in orbit around the planet. According to her, the sound was quiet, barely noticeable. All the other swan singers missed it, even the ones on the Hidori. But it was there. Serata frowned. A vessel silently entering the stream. Certainly not a syndicate vessel. Keep me informed if you detect anything else. Who is the swan singer that detected the vessel? Ensign Jean Summer Kirk, sir. Only just been assigned. Have her transferred to the Hidori, Serata ordered. Talent like hers is rare and should be cultivated properly. I foresee a rather promising career for her if she keeps this up. Yes, my lord, the captain responded, saluting by planting a clenched fist over his left breast, his fingers separated to form a circle over his heart, like the outline of a planet. As mother commands, so shall it be. As mother commands, so shall it be, Serata responded before the transmission ended. Serata hummed. A vessel that was capable of entering the stream silently. He only knew of only one vessel that was capable of that, but why would it be all the way out here? And why would its captain be interested in Earth? Seems like this little planet on the other side of the galaxy is attracting a lot of attention. Mostly because of quirks and the potential for heretics to make human-Semitic hybrids. If Earth is to know peace, then this will have to change. The jump ship shuddered slightly. From one of the screens he could see the ship slowing down to approach the shuttle bay. A landing platform on the inside of the platform's ring. The ship landed with a slight shudder. Once down, the lift it had landed on proceeded down into the station's hangar bay. A large metal door closed above it as it descended down into the hangar proper. 
About a minute later, the lift came to a stop. Its destination reached. Descent complete. We are down. Serata nodded before he dismissed the screens. He then stood up, made his way to the loading ramp and disembarked. When he departed from the jump ship, he was met by an Imperial officer and two Marines. Each Marine was holding a psionic halberd. Deactivated of course. Serata walked past them without a word, letting the officer and two Marines walk in line beside him. My lord, I don't wish to bother you, but the prefect is getting quite angry at not having a jump ship assigned to get him off Earth, the officer said. How long until all the jump ships have finished their maintenance cycles? Serata asked. At least three more days, the officer replied. Then that is how long he shall wait, Serata said. If he wanted to play golf, then he should have done so in an AR room, and not used military equipment to transport him to Earth. Let this be a lesson to him. Yes my, my lord, the officer replied. Also the recon team reports that they found the body Zaraba was previously using. His insides had turned completely into honey. Lessie and Venom, Serata remarked. Seems like Agent did manage to get a hit on him. But that was months ago. He must have found a way to temporarily counteract the effects, the officer said. It would explain why he attacked the training camp when he was so close to completing his objective. He couldn't hold the venom back anymore and had to switch bodies, Serata said. I'd have been impressed if he wasn't a heretic. We need to be more vigilant next time. Thanks to the prefect's actions a heretic came dangerously close to taking on a hybrid body. This must not be allowed to happen again. We can start by finding out why the Palmy wasn't in Earth orbit? The prefect overruled the admiral and ordered her back to the rupee, the officer replied. Then send her back. Serata ordered. With the majority of the fleet outside the system looking for any additional wormholes, we need an assault star cutter in orbit around Earth at all times. The prefect is starting to abuse his position. If he tries to overrule the admiral again, deny him his request. I am starting to question that man's loyalty to the Imperium. It will be done, my lord, the office said. Good, Serata said before they walked for a bit more. Have the three new hybrids been added to the database? They have, but their files are incomplete, the office replied. We're just waiting for your sister to meet them and complete their files. My sister's already here? Serata asked, raising an eyebrow. That was quick. I sent the message to her only a few days ago. She was already in the system, the officer replied. Came aboard with the last supply ship. She asked that you not be informed about her arrival. I see, Serata said. His sister was always a sneaky one, always like liking to pay him surprise visits. Has she made contact with them yet? Unknown sir, the officer replied. We've received no transmissions from her since her deployment yesterday. And we can't risk trying to contact her without running the risk of blowing whatever cover she is trying to make. Noted, Serata said as they reached an elevator. Inform me when she reports in. Yes my lord, the officer said as he and the two marines stopped, while Serata entered the elevator alone. Once inside the doors closed automatically, and started moving without any physical input. As he stood in the elevator, a dark presence made itself known. My lord, a dark, whispery voice spoke behind him. Have you completed your investigation into the prefect? Serata asked. Unfazed by the presence behind him. This fragment reports finding several suspicious articles in the prefect's possession, the voice spoke. Such as the components to make a rift transponder, discreetly hidden within other appliances. Serata growled. The Marish Syndicate. Shall this fragment terminate the prefect's life upon his return? The voice asked. No, Serata ordered. We must find his contact within the syndicate first before we arrest him. Put a bug within the rift transponder. The next time he uses it, we shall hear everything he says. With any luck, he shall divulge who his contacts are with the syndicate. And from there, we can find out how they are able to operate out here. 
There were only two known wormholes that led out here, and one of them was unstable and couldn't really be used. And yet, the Marish Syndicate and Cardri Investral are still capable of deploying ships out here. So either there was a wormhole they didn't know about, or they were able to stabilize the other wormhole without the Imperium knowing about it. This fragment understands the orders it has been given, and shall obey, the voice spoke before the Dark Presence left the room. Sarada was unbothered by the presence that had just left him. him. The fragment was a useful tool in rooting out corruption within the Imperium. Moments later the elevator stopped, and the doors opened to reveal a large garden with an artificial sky. The garden was large and simplistic. There were hundreds of plants from hundreds of different environments and planets, all painstakingly cared for by the most important member of the carrier battle group. There were several Imperial Navy personnel walking around the garden. Yet only one of them was tending to the plants. A tall woman with long brown hair tied into a loose braid and hanging over her left shoulder. She wore a white apron over a blue dress. She was currently pruning some blue and yellow rose-like flowers. Sarada proceeded towards the woman, stopping a few paces away from her. You require something of me, my child? The woman asked in a motherly tone, still focusing on her pruning. The last of the heretics who made it to earth have been eliminated, Sarada reported. I know, the woman said. It brings me no joy ordering their destruction, some of them were far too young, but it must be done. Sarada lowered his head. Indeed, for teenagers and children to be tricked and persuaded to follow such a dark path is unforgivable. Unfortunately, there is no turning back. Death is the only cure to this sickness. Yes. That is the fate of all those who follow that path, the woman said, cutting off one of the flowers for emphasis. I warn you all that such a path is dangerous and must not be followed. That the soul is a precious thing that must never be messed with. And yet, there are some who just do not listen to me, who corrupt and taint their own souls by devouring the souls of others, forever changing themselves into all-consuming monsters. And yet, I can't help but feel respons responsible for each and every single one of my children who go down that path. As a mother, it is my duty to guide you the best I can down the right path. As reassuring those words are, Sarada said. You have told me that hundreds of times before. I have? The woman said. Oh, of course. My apologies. It's not easy to remember which of my children I've told that to. My memory isn't what it once was. Well there are untold billions of us, Sarada remarked. It's not easy to keep an eye on us all. Indeed it is, the woman said. If only I could keep an eye on all of you. Then perhaps I could stop more of you from going down such a dark path. And more will come, Sarada said with a frown. Until the lords are killed, and what was taken from you returned, the heretics will continue to grow in strength. Indeed they will, the woman said with a frown. I just hope no more try to come here. And if more do arrive in the system? Sarada asked. Why simple, Sakura, the mother of all Semitics, said with a motherly smile. What you always do. Kill them. And send their souls to me, so I may burn them to nothing. UA High School. 1A Dorm. So, let me get this straight, Mina said. Your variant, called the Imperial Variant, all belong to the Semitic Imperium. An empire that can be best described as a fusion of the Empire from Star Wars and the Imperium of Man from Warhammer 40k. Who are the most overpowered variant of Semitic out there with OP please nerf levels of psychic powers. And this Imperium is currently in charge of ensuring that hybrids like you don't have their bodies taken over by those heretics. Did I get that right? Achoko nodded. Yeah, that's about it, she said, having just finished her explanation of just how powerful her variant was. The variant's real name is Arcistus, but people just call us Imperials of Imps due to our association with the Imperium. Imperium. But I have a long way to go before I'm as strong as other Imps. I was sort of neglecting my abilities for most of my life, so I'm not as strong as I should be. It'll be years before I can catch up to where I should be. I see, Mina said. And you are, just how strong are these imps? 
Well, picture Darth Vader, Achako said, noting the shocked looks already forming on everyone's faces. Now, picture an army of Darth Vaders. That is how strong the standard Imperial variant soldier is. And they only get stronger from there. Thank you, Hitoshi said. I am now never going to get any sleep again knowing that there is an army of people as strong as Darth Vader out there. Well, I for one hope we never encounter one of these imps, Hanta remarked. If they are as powerful as you say they are, then they would be able to curb stomp us just as easily as that heretic. To be fair, that thing was very much weakened by being inside a human body at the time, Achiko said. Had it been inside a Semitic body, then we would have all died before we even realized it was there. Telepathy and telekinesis is a powerful combination. I would like to speak to life's manager and ask why he made them that insanely OP and why he hasn't nerfed them yet. Toru asked. Yeah, that's not happening sadly, Achiko replied. You can't really nerf real life. No matter how many people wished the Imperium to be a little bit weaker. So, I don't want to be a downer or anything, Inesa said. But what's stopping them from invading us? Absolutely nothing, Achiko replied. Apart from the fact that we're on the complete other side of the galaxy to the Imperium and that it takes about a year to get anything out here. This is space we're talking about here. It is big. Even moving around a star system can take days or weeks. Plus the Imperial variant is relatively small compared to the other variants. From what I've been told, only a seventh of the Imperium's active military is composed of Imperial variant sem Semitics. The rest are all from other variants that they've conquered. After all, Rolls told her that there are only 15 billion Imperial variant Semitics. The next smallest variant, the Royal variant, has over 50. Quality over quantity, Fumikage remarked. Trust the most powerful variant to also be the smallest. So we're not at risk of being invaded by aliens then, Inesa said with a sigh of relief. That's good to know. Well, invaded by the Semitics no, Achiko said. Other aliens, not so sure. I don't know if there are any other races in our area of the galaxy, but it is a possibility. Not counting Semitics there are about 12 other alien races living in and around the two nebulae. So, there's a fair chance that there are other races native to our area of space. Ah, Inesa said. Well, let's hope they don't choose to invade here. Probably won't, Durandell remarked. Invading a planet, especially one as densely populated as Earth, would be a costly endeavor. Plus you have to garrison an entire planet with a population of billions. Trust me, no one is going to even try to occupy Earth. They'd probably just nuke you into oblivion. Durandal, Izumi said, noting how shocked everyone looked. Please, stop stating facts. We're all freaked out enough as it is. Durandal nodded. But had he had a face he would have had a smug look on it. Well, at least we only have two hybrids to worry about at the moment, Denki remarked. Himiko held up her hand, and Achiko passed her the plush. Make that three hybrids we have to worry about because I am one as well. Everyone turned towards Himiko with shock and surprised looks on their faces. You're a hybrid as well, Sue blinked. Why didn't you tell me? I was going to, Himiko replied. But I only found out that I was a hybrid a day into the camp and wanted to learn a bit more about what I was before telling you. Then we got attacked by a soul-eating monster and I kind of had bigger things to worry about. Ah, I see, Sue said. You are forgiven, Ribbit. Wow, that was surprisingly easy, Toro remarked. She had a legitimate reason for not telling me, Sue said with a shrug. I can understand that. So Himiko is also a hybrid as well, Denki groaned. She is, but we're not sure what variant, Achiko said. As far as we can tell, her telepathy is fueled by blood, and instead of telepathy and telekinesis, she can intercept telepathic communications, getting stronger the more blood she's consumed. It's a similar situation with Eri, although whilst we know what variant she is, it's an extinct variant. The Lidded variant was the only known variant capable of communicating telepathically with machines. Unfortunately, the heretics wiped them out, consuming every last one of their souls. 
Obviously, a few survived by joining the heretics' ranks. Everyone looked horrified. An entire Semitic variant, wiped out by soul-consuming heretics. It must have been horrifying for those people, to have your very souls consumed by beings that looked just like them but were far from normal. And several of them joined their numbers, for what? More power? These heretics both horrified and sickened them. Don't forget about the pirate Empress Paltheus who killed a god by ramming her ship into it, Durandal remarked. I'm not joking about the killing a god thing. Insert extremely low budget clip made in mod of the Enterprise ramming god. Everyone was moments away from a massive freakout. These heretics were one thing, but to find out that someone had managed to kill a god, who are real by the way, was both horrifying and terrifying. So, so, the heretics have access to a variant whose telepathy works on machines, Tenya remarked. And the only other non-heretic member of this variant is a pirate who killed a god. I believe it would be in our best interests that Ari never meet any of these people. Especially this Paltheus woman. I'd ask why she's called the Pirate Empress, but I think killing a god gives you enough clout to call yourself whatever you want, Minoru remarked, trying his hardest to not imagine what this Paltheus woman looked like. Trying was the operative word of that sentence, because a woman that badass just had to be hot. Well, Momo said, ice twitching. As informative as this has been, Achiko dear, please stop talking. I feel like I'm close to having a mental breakdown with all this. Yeah, apologies about that, Achiko said nervously. There was a lot to talk about and it can be seen as a bit of a dump. Might need to space this out a bit. I would have to agree, Tenya said. We've learned a lot today, and it's a bit too much for us right now. But, do not think we will think differently of you. You are our classmate, Achiko. We aren't going to abandon you so easily. Yeah, what Tenya said, Ijiro said. It would be unmanly to abandon you after everything we've been through. Plus you being part alien sounds really cool. Achiko smiled, happy that her classmates were understanding of her situation. We should probably call it a day for the truth room, Momo said. Achiko's explanation was rather heavy. Agreed, Shiharu said. That was a lot to process and I don't think anyone else is ready to talk about what was revealed about them. Well, if you will excuse me, I need to find a place to nap with this cat, Hitoshi said before he left the room, followed by a jealous-looking Yui. The rest of their classmates filed out of the room, leaving Achiko, Izumi, and Durandal. Well, that went better than I expected it to go, Achiko remarked, remarked. A part of me expected the worst. Achiko, Izumi said. After everything we've been through, why on earth would any of our classmates abandon us? Even over something like this? Good point, Achiko said. At least, I've been able to get this off my chest. And none of them seemed mad about it. What about you and one for all? Izumi frowned. I'm not ready to tell them about it yet. Maybe in a few weeks once everything settled down, but not right now. I still have a few things I need to sort out. It's too soon to tell them. Achoko nodded. Izumi may not look it, but she wasn't in the best state of mind right now. The events of the camp attack have left a deep mark on her, one that will take a long time to recover from. Especially considering that it wasn't just one for all that was revealed. At least we now know what variant you and Eri are from now, Durandal said. Seriously, the Semitic Imperium sounds like someone you do not want to mess with. Well, I didn't mention this, but... Rolls told me that everyone over the age of 20 in the Imperium is a fully trained soldier, Achiko said. National conscription is a thing over there with all adults over 18 required to spend at least a year in the military. And, whilst most leave after their conscription is over, it is possible for the Imperium to mobilize its entire population. They just don't because doing so would bankrupt them. So, they all know how to fight a war. I can see why they are considered the most powerful variant, Durandal remarked. Also I couldn't help but note that you didn't say that they don't have the equipment to arm them all. Yeah, about that, Achiko said nervously. You keep your weapon and armor after you leave and are expected to keep them in good condition. 
I am, so glad I'm a hybrid born on earth and not as a pure imperial. Because I could not handle all that military stuff. And yet you made the imperial Machi Empire in Stellaris, Izumi remarked. And regularly commit virtual intergalactic genocide. It's to get rid of the lag. Achoko said. And yes, sometimes I may let my imp sideshow from time to time. But I'm trying not to. Ever since Rolls told me what my father was as well as what variant I was both horrified and disappointed. Horrified that my father was a heretic, and disappointed that I wasn't as strong as I should be. Even now, I'm still so very, very weak compared to others like me. Even Rolls, who I should be way stronger than, is stronger than me. How am I supposed to catch up? Izumi suddenly hugged her. It's okay, Achiko. Do you know why? Because I am here. I'm sure I can help you catch up somehow. You have something no other member of your kind has. You can take someone's gravity away from them. Rolls and others like her can't do that. Plus with your telekinesis, you should be able to use your quirk on someone remotely. Achoko blinked. How did you know that was how I could reactivate my quirk on someone? Izumi smiled. Just a guess. Well I wasn't lying when I said it got harder to do the longer it's been since I've used it on someone, Achiko said. Well hopefully, with practice, you'll be able to increase the gap, Izumi said with a smile. Maybe even be able to use it without ever touching the target, dot. You think I'll be able to do that? Achoko asked. Izumi nodded. I believe so. Who knows what else you can do with your quirk and semitic powers combined. You can already move things that are under the effects of your quirk around, it's possible that you are capable of other things. Achiko smiled and hugged Izumi. Thank you. Izumi quickly returned the hug. There was a su sudden knock on the door, followed by the door opening and Himiko poked her head in. Hey, she said nervously. I don't know if you're busy or something, but can I ask you a favor, Achiko? Sure, Achiko replied. Himiko smiled as she stepped in, closing the door behind her. Thanks. So, I was wondering if you could give me some advice on how to protect my mind. Like that advice you gave to Eri. Achiko blinked. What advice? The advice you told Eri, Himiko said. About how to safely control her powers? You've been doing it almost every night. Himiko, I've only recently been able to talk to people telepathically, Achiko said. The first time I was able to deliberately talk to someone with my mind was a few weeks ago. As much as I wanted to, I could not speak to Eri telepathically. Then, if you haven't been giving advice to Eri, then who has? Himiko asked. The three of them froze. If Achiko hadn't been talking to Eri telepathically, and it couldn't have been Himiko as she can only intercept transmissions. Then that left only one other possibility. There's another hybrid in UA. Durandal said, saying what was on everyone's mind. There was a sudden telepathic giggle inside the minds of the three girls. Well, looks like you finally noticed me. Who are you? Izumi asked. Oh, just another hybrid on UA grounds, the voice replied. I was wondering how long it was going to be before you managed to notice me. The fact that I was the only one who knew about you doesn't help, Himiko said. Well, I wasn't aware that there was someone who could intercept telepathy, the voice said. Not that I'm mad. It was getting quite boring, sitting idly by and waiting for you to find out about me. What were you doing to Eri? Izumi demanded. Nothing harmful, the voice said. Just teaching her a few things she needed to know. Why? Achoko asked. Simple, she needed to be taught the basics, the voice said. Achoko didn't need that training, since she already received it. But then, why didn't you try and contact me? Achoko asked. There was no reply. The fucking bastard, Achoko cursed. Himiko, any idea where the transmission was coming from? Izumi asked. Do I look like I am able to tell what direction a telepathic transmission is coming from? 
Himiko asked. I don't even know how I can intercept them. Izumi nodded. Point made. So I take it you just spoke to the other hybrid? Durandal asked, getting nods from the three girls. Well, that just confirmed it, there's another hybrid on UA soil. Now the question is, where is she? And why haven't they made contact with Achiko until now? I don't know, they decided to fuck off when I asked. Achiko replied, quite infuriated that there was another hybrid on UA soil who decided to not interact with her. I don't think we'll be able to use the voice to recognize who it was, Izumi said. It was androgynous, so there's no way we can use that to identify them. Maybe speech patterns? Damn it, I wasn't expecting to have to deal with a hybrid. We may need to ask Rolls for help on this. I might have to, Achiko said. I want to find out who this other hybrid is. Same, Himiko said. They could have saved us a lot of trouble by just revealing themselves to us sooner. We might have had a better idea of what we are before we encountered Rolls. Let's agree to not tell anyone else about this just yet, Izumi said. I want to find out who this fourth hybrid is before we tell them. They might get paranoid and we do not need that right now. The others nodded. This needed to be handled with care. The class was still recovering and they needed to identify this new hybrid first and find out their motive. They were clearly on UA grounds. Only UA students knew about Aerie. It couldn't have been a teacher as they would not have withheld such information from one of their own. Probably. So, the hybrid was probably a student. It couldn't have been one of their classmates, they would have been revealed by now. Nor could it be Meichuharu. So that left the hundreds of other students on the premises. Bugger. That will be it for this part. I hope everyone enjoyed if you did please leave a like and comment if you want part 79. If you want to hear more from me subscribe I hope to see you all in the next one.